In looking at this program, if you were looking at the conference brochure, you're seeing this program and there's nothing in it about ACEWARE, about student manager. He said, well, I thought this was an ACEWARE users conference. Well, it is, and the issue really falls down to, comes up to, centers around the fact, our business. ACEWARE supports the business of lifelong learning and continuing ed. And again, you in your schools, you in your organizations, your livelihood as a job depends on A, is the business healthy? Do you understand the business? Do you know where it's going? The old, I'm their leader, where are they going? I, you know, I must find them, I'm their leader. And so we really did feel that it's important for us as practitioners, and maybe you think, well, I'm just a registrar and I just, I just program classes, but you are a part of that cog, you're part that makes that business run. And as a part, no matter where you are, you need to make sure you share with the people in your organization things that you're learning that you can help to make sure you're gonna be there in five years, 10 years to serve the people that you're here to serve. So that's why we have the panel. I'd like to introduce from left to right the panel and then we'll, we don't really have an order. Sharon, did we decide we had an order? Kind of let maybe we'll let we'll let Marilyn start on the far end there. She they're, they're all local, so we'll have a chance to hear from them. Marilyn Mahan is vice president of instruction at Manhattan Area Technical College. I think, and, uh, and again here in town has been a business came into the business from the business education side, and so she'll talk about kind of the two year technical side of things. And again, these folks are going to kind of share with you some of their visions of where. The industry is going, and again, these are pretty much all represent the kind of businesses, communities, professions you're serving. Uh, Brandy Miller is with the Kansas State Grains Program, the Kansas State International Grains Program, and uh, has done a lot of work with uh, uh, credentialing uh, operators of feed, uh, grain elevators. Uh, among other things, and works with uh, some international programs areas, so looking at more local with technical college, industry-wide, specific, international with the grants program. Uh, Linda Tiener is executive director of the UFM program here in Manhattan, one of the nation's oldest community-based, semi-independent uh, community ed programs. And I've had the privilege of serving on the board of directors for years, and with this, uh, 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 let me play with continuing it and get back to my roots on that. So, and then um, um, uh, Dave, I'm having a senior moment. Stewart. Dave Stewart, whom I've only known for 30 years here, <laughs> senior moment, uh, who is, uh, and I'm taking the title, your your assistant. Associate Dean at the Division of Continuing Studies here at K-State <clears throat> and works primarily in the areas of credit programs and does a lot with military education with our folks at Fort Riley, extended credit and the whole credit component. I know we've got a few folks that work in the credit here. So, uh, Marilyn, I'm gonna let you start. I'm gonna ask if you'd have and again, kind of share some of their perspectives about what they're seeing on their horizon and with what's going on. Thank you. It's good to be here this morning, so thanks for this invitation. Um, I am at MHEC, Manhattan Area Technical College. I've been there now. This is my sixth year. Uh, actually, I was an instructor there for 14 years, mm, quite a well. while. So I, I come to this institution um, because I love technical education, so that, that's really primarily why I'm there. I also have been Associate Dean for Career and Tech Ed um, at Butler Community College here in Kansas. And I was Dean of Continuing Education at Garden City Community College, also here in Kansas for five years. So my background really uh, spans the continuing education, technical education arena um, for the last 15 years. So um, I'm excited to be part of all of that. We are a two-year college that is uh, accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. Uh, we have 14 programs of study in particular. Um, and within those programs of study, we have both full-time and part-time enrollments. We also um, then have additional students who are taking um, general education classes. 
because we are able to award Associate of Applied Science degrees, we do have students coming to us who maybe are taking prereqs to get into our professional programs, or they may be just coming as a non-degree seeking student wanting to take some courses. So listening this morning to the, the summary of some of the things that you all were talking about yesterday, um, I see a role that our continuing education arena could serve in some of those um, other areas that you on the non-degree seeking side, especially as it relates to uh, the, the developmental side. And we are really working on, on how do we do that in a better manner. Uh, we provide short-term technical training um, as requested through our continu continuing education area. We have a new uh, program director right now, so we are really revamping and revitalizing that area. We um, have not been real active in the community as it relates to continuing education, and that is changing as with more people are coming to us and saying, we need XYZ training. So we're really trying to be more responsive to what, what's actually needed out there. We also recognize that there's a need for additional professional development that's not being served in our region right now. So what are those things? And some of our challenges then, how do we determine specifically what those things are? And then how do we get it to the right audience to target that specifically? And I think that maybe is a challenge that all of you sometimes face as well. Who's your target audience for a particular training that you are doing? We recently completed a GIS training at we had a, a company come to us and say, we believe that there needs to be GIS training for, in particular, um, county and city officials who do a lot with GIS. They had a trainer lined up, so we actually worked with this company, worked with that trainer, and they had a listserv, so they sent the information out to that listserv. But we also realized when we did that training, which was very successful, that there are other individuals who are needing this type of training as well. So now how do we pull that together? Because we were working with a third party on uh, getting that all developed. We don't want to burn our bridges in any way, so how do we really roll that out a little bit better than two? So we know that's an opportunity waiting for us. We also do a lot of industry-specific continuing education. We don't really run it through the realm of continuing education. A lot of our faculty are very uh, entrepreneurial themselves. Um, we have a lot of work that's being done in the auto collision industry. Uh, our instructor is ICAR certified and all of the auto collision um, technicians have to continue to get continuing education. So if any of you have technical areas on your campuses, you may want to look at what's happening particularly in that area then as well. Um, that one is a, an easy piece to do. It's not a money maker at all for us. Actually, what we do is provide uh, the facilities and allow it to just run. We do the same thing with auto technology. So there are a lot of technical areas. Uh, professionals need to have that continuing education opportunity available to them. Some of the opportunities that, that I see for us um, is that we are flexible and that short term uh, the quick turnaround time we know is really important to our, um, to our audiences. Also that incubation aspect. Uh, what can we develop within the continuing education arena as an incubation idea that could possibly turn into more of a program of study? So we're looking at a couple of different areas right now, some growth areas here in Manhattan that we think might be uh, good incubation uh, opportunities for continuing education. And again, it's that quick turnaround time, the non-credit aspect, as opposed to developing the credit side. So we really see that as a, a great opportunity. Some of the challenges that we have are finding individuals who are both good, um, at what they do, but that they can also teach, they can also train. I don't know if any of you have that as a challenge, but that definitely is a challenge for us. One that comes to mind in particular as we were developing our bioscience curriculum, uh, this was on the credit side of the house, we were working with subject matter experts and the subject matter experts we needed because industry told us we needed to utilize subject matter experts to develop the curriculum. 
So what we found, though, is that the subject matter experts really didn't understand education and the side of education, the things that we have to do from that perspective. So through a National Science Foundation uh, ATE grant, one of our deliverables was to develop uh, train, like a train the trainer, how do we move an industry professional into the education arena. We have that material developed. Our challenge now is to figure out how to take it out of our learning management system and put it into a platform that could be accessed by lots of other people. When we did a Google search uh, on a train the trainer, moving industry professionals into education, we found bits and pieces, but nothing that was cohesive. So our challenge was to put this into a cohesive document. So we believe that other people who will be very interested in this as well, because we're all trying to work with, with those professionals, but help them become good educators as well, and understand the language of education too, as it relates to outcomes and uh, competencies and assessment and, and all of that. But I think it would be a good opportunity for in, those of you in the continuing education area as well to help those folks understand a little bit more that education and that training side too. I heard um, soft skills mentioned this morning as well and a program that was developed between our continuing education area and our workforce development is a book called BEST and I believe BEST stands for here I say I believe, I always forget exactly what the B is, but I think it's Better Employment Skills Training, something along that line. If you go to Amazon and do just a search on capital B, E, S, T, you would find a book there. So if you're interested, I would encourage you to look at that as well. We've utilized that for a lot of training sessions with our businesses in the area, and that uh, seemed to be very successful in that soft skills side. So you may want to take a look at that. Um, blended learning, we do a lot of that at NATC, not so much in the continuing ed side, but on the, um, the instruction side, where we have online, face -to -face, uh, online lecture courses and then face-to-face -face labs that correlate with the online side. So the blended learning really seems to fit a lot of our learners. So again, in the continuing education side, we'll be moving in that direction probably more as well. Um, there are a lot of other things that we do, but I think I've probably used up my time, and I'm going to pass it on to Brandy. And Brandy, before we let you start, again, we'll go through each uh, presenter or each panelist to give about a 7 to 10, and then we're going to, I'll try to get some questions started, but we'll have a chance to again quiz them about things that might you might want to have them uh, give in more detail. All right, well, thank you also for being here. I had the opportunity yesterday to sit through the roundtables, and it was really exciting to get to learn and understand some of the challenges that have and realize that they're quite similar regardless of where you are. Um, as was mentioned, I work at the International Grades Program Conference Center, which is located here in Manhattan. I am the Associate Director of the Jeeps K-State Distance Education Program, and Jeeps stands for Grain Elevator and Processing Society. So everything that we do is related to grain handling and grain storage. And with regards to the IGP, or the International Grains Program, we love acronyms. I don't know if you have that in your area, but I will try to do my best to spell out exactly what I'm talking about. But with IGP, it's basically a, um, an institute that was built by commodities and farmers in Kansas. And so they funded our building. We're celebrating our 10th birthday in our building this year, which is, which is exciting. And the purpose of the training that's done facilitated IGP is to work at, with in, industry professionals in the grain industry to train them on how to utilize commodities. And specifically, we really focus on Kansas commodities because that's what funds our program. But we deliver training on um, risk management, grain trading, feed manufacturing, HACCP, which is hazard analysis, critical control points, and flour milling. And we do a gamut of flour milling, specialty milling. So we have a very exciting program and we're continuing to grow. The other area that we're growing, that is all done face to face. And so we bring people in from all over the US and internationally into our facility and we train them at IGP and we utilize, we have some full scale feed manufacturing facilities, extrusion facilities. So if you're interested in how to make cheese puffs, we can show you how to do that. <laughs> um, and flour milling, and some people don't realize it's quite a process. So. Uh, we were able to bring people in, train them, and actually show them how to use the actual equipment that they're going to be using in their everyday, day-to-day -day job. What we've really grown in the last five years since I've been in my position is the distance ed side. 
And the reason why we've done that is because travel is becoming even more expensive, especially for international participants. And so we're really trying to focus on more of kind of a hybrid type of blended learning. But it's at the program level, it's not really at the course level. So we're leveraging distance education to get participants to the same place educationally and then bringing them to IGP and able to focus more on face-to-face -face training with them. So we're kind of using that model a little bit differently. We don't have the flexibility to do a blended model when people are here. So we're trying to utilize distance education and also as a marketing tool to get people excited to want them to come. With the Jeeps piece of my job, um, that program has really exploded. And I think the reason why that is is that we started from the very beginning getting industry input and buy-in. And I think that's really important with any program that you have. I'm fortunate enough that the grain industry is really quite small, even though we deal with a massive amount of grain storage in the U.S. Um, it's very connected. And so we've had the opportunity to build this program with the industry and get their input. What are your needs? What type of training are you missing? What can we do? And then even through the development process, they're engaged. And so we are working directly with industry professionals to deliver training, review training that's actually being built, um, and then participate in the training that's being delivered. So they're there throughout the whole process. And I think that that's really what lends itself to the success that we've seen in our program, both on the distance and the face-to-face -face side. Um, we work with another association. It's the American Feed Industry Association as well. And somebody mentioned this morning partnerships. I think that is so important if you have the ability to partner with organizations because they can help you market. They can help bring people to your courses. Um, again, my area is very specific, so we know who those people are. It's easy to find those associations, but those partnerships that we've built have been just invaluable. We can't even explain how important they are to our business model. So um, what are we working on? The things that we're looking at doing, just more growing our blended and hybrid learning type of models so that we can leverage more distance education, professional development, and then bring people in and do some more specific hands-on, face-to-face um, training. We're also looking at trying to build more learner-centric type of training. And so uh, it's really easy to, I, I feel it's really easy to lecture, especially as a lecturer, it's, that's such an easy way to teach. But as a learner, that's not that much fun. I mean, I can sit and talk to you for hours, and I'm sure you'd really enjoy that, right? <laughs> but if I engage you, and I ask questions, and I make the, the uh, learning process a little more interactive, then you're going to get a lot more out of it. And uh, it's going to just make for a better environment. So that's really been our focus at IGP for our face-to-face -face learning. Um, we're exploring some different options for using clicker technology, which I know has been around for a long time. But we haven't been using it. I think we have some, some opportunity to do some assessment as we're teaching and um, do some engagement with clicker technology. Also doing some assessment, evaluating the learning experience and just really trying to do some more collaborative learning techniques in the classroom. And we're also trying to apply some of that on the distance side, uh, which is a lot more challenging because it's hard to offer an asynchronously delivered course when people are in there at all different times and have that same authentic learning experience. But that's kind of the path that we're trying to go down. Um, let's see, what else are we doing here? Um, we've launched two different credentials in the last two years. And that has also helped us uh, be very successful. The first one is with the Jeeps program, and so it's a completely distance offer credential program. And again, we've worked with the industry to identify what courses need to be developed and delivered in order to have a successful credential, and what would your employees need to have at the base level. So we have this grain operations credential, and theoretically you could take these courses, there are five new courses over one year, and it would be ambitious, but you can do it. And um, you could get a credential at the end of the year. And then in order to maintain it, you have to get continuing education units over an additional three years to maintain it. So we're constantly trying to encourage industry professionals to keep learning. We want to foster this lifelong learning type of environment. And then on the milling science side, we've done something very similar, but we're tying in more hands-on applied learning. So we have this hybrid model where you have three courses that you take via distance, and then you come to IGP and you do some more hands-on, more applied focus learning at IGP. So we've, we've got a lot of opportunities and areas that we can still continue to grow. Um, but I think that you know some of the challenges that you're experiencing, we're also experiencing. So it's great just to kind of learn from others and see things that we can do and implement in order to get through those uh, some of those challenges. So. Yeah. Thank you.
Brandy. Hi, I'm Linda Teeter from UFM Community Learning Center. We are kind of the odd dog in any group. Um, we are at one of the oldest community education programs in the United States, and we don't have a faculty. We go to the community every semester to recruit people who are interested in sharing something that they know with the rest of the community, and we've done that since the beginning. Uh, we offer uh, about 250 non-credit classes each semester. We have between 85 and 90 credit classes that are affiliated with K-State. We have the oldest community garden in Kansas. We have 18 mentoring program. We have a, a program specific for older adults. We have a program specific for special needs adults. Uh, and a lot of collaborations and other things I haven't even thought of. So we do a lot of different things uh, in the community and across the state of Kansas. Uh, I made some notes based on the things that I heard this morning before I talk about the other things that I wanted to mention. And um, participants, our participants have ranged in age from six, to, I'm sorry, our teachers have ranged in age from six to 98. And our participants range in age from six months probably to 100. <laughs> Um, so we have we try to program for the entire community in one way or another. Um, one thing that I heard was increase in online registrations and uh, less paper. Uh, and we know that um, I think we were one of the guinea pigs for Ace Web long ago, and we've noticed that we have between about 75 percent of all of our registrations now come in. Uh, online, and that's helped us office-wise. It's helped with our staffing issues. But I would discourage you from eliminating paper. Uh, do not stop printing paper brochures and paper information. Research I have seen over and over shows that when you do that, your enrollments go down. Um, so don't let them convince you that because the catalog is online, you don't need that piece of paper because it serves a lot of marketing functions in addition to getting enrollments. It might be sitting in the grocery store or the doctor's office or uh, various places around town and people pick up and look at it. Uh, so it's a good marketing tool, it's a registration tool, and when you've got a catalog as big as ours, uh, it's really hard to uh, get it all absorbed uh, by just looking at things online and you won't see some of the new things that are going on. Um, I think we have seen the, mm, I guess, pressure to try doing some online things. It's difficult for us because we don't have a faculty that we can force to do online things. Um, and so we have a few things that we've been trying. Blended learning works very well for us in collaboration with some other organizations uh, where they do the book learning online and then come in for skills testing. Uh, that's worked very well for first aid CPR, particularly for us. Um, and I heard some comments about groups such as ed to go um, and using them for online courses. And that's been a struggle for us because our philosophy is very community-oriented and very grassroots. And it's hard for us to market a class when we don't know who the instructor is and we don't know what the content and it would be an easy way for us to make some money. Um, but it's not ethically okay for us to just say, well, I don't know who this Chuck guy is who's teaching this <laughs> class, but we're going to let him teach the class and we're going to offer it like it's our own. Uh, and so we've had some issues with those kinds of platforms um, and have not resisted going to them so far because we've been able to generate enough revenue in other ways that we don't have to do that. It might come to that someday. But I also, I'm not required, but I ask my staff to try online courses too, so they get a feel for what it's like to be a student online as we're trying to figure out how to teach online courses and try out different platforms to see what works well uh, for the various kinds of non-credit things that we might do, which is where we would be going. Uh, and with the proliferation of YouTube videos and some 
very inexpensive but professionally done platforms turn on credit stuff, it becomes difficult to think about doing non-credit. But the other thing that I think is important is face-to-face -face stuff. And for community education, getting together and talking about stuff is important. And it's, I guess it's that soft skill thing that um, I can learn it online, but I would rather come and talk to Brandy about it and have her show me right here how it works. And that seems to work well for us. Um, we've noticed trends in promotion um, going far more and more to social media outlets that seem to work well. Um, email marketing and some things like that uh, have worked well for us. Facebook works very well for what we have to do, but we still use paper things as well. Um, and then the other trend that we have seen um, is that trend toward recycling, upcycling, do it yourself, or somebody said was going down. Uh, it's very popular here. We have a, a group called the Resiliency Coalition who organizes all those classes for us, and we have a, a, a partnership with them to do that, and they do everything from how to do your own laundry soap to um, herbs and cooking to a solar cooperative. Beer? No, they don't do beer. Yeah. That's another group. Another group does beer. Yeah, if you want to talk about popular classes, beer tasting and wine tasting are some of our hottest products. Uh, we've also done martini making and uh, tequila. They like to drink in Manhattan cans. <laughs> Trust us, after last night, we know. <laughs> But those have been some of our hot classes, and I guess that's what I would um, talk about in terms of trends. Uh, also trying to look at our accountability, even though we're using all volunteers, we still want to offer the best quality courses we have. So trying to do some things with instructors and evaluation to make sure that we're offering the best product we can uh, to the community, even with the caveat that these are volunteers and you might not expect the same level of uh, professionalism from a nine-year-old who's teaching rubber band bracelets that you might from an adult teaching guitar lessons or something. So um, our community has been very accepting of what we do, very supportive of us for a very, very long time. Thank you, Lynn.
It's all good. I can hear me. Can you hear me? Uh, well, as Chuck uh, said, I'm Dave Stewart. I'm Associate Dean for the Division of Continuing Education at K-State. I work uh, not exclusively, but primarily on the credit side of our house. Uh, the Division of Continuing Education is uh, uh, does both uh, credit and non-credit professional development uh, uh, coordination. Uh, some of you uh, will understand when I say we are a centralized unit at the university, meaning that uh, we're our own unit, but we have staff that are assigned to uh, the various colleges and uh, other units at the university. We find that and there's, that's an ongoing debate, has been for years, uh, whether it's better to be centralized or decentralized. I think uh, the reason it works very well for us, there are several. It's, uh, uh, from our perspective, more efficient. Uh, there is a synergy that gets created among staff uh, through their interactions with, uh, uh, with each other, in addition to those with whom they work in the uh, various uh, university units. So uh, that's how we're organized, a uh, very quick description. Uh, we have a staff of uh, approximately uh, 50 full-time, <clears throat> probably another uh, 50 uh, student staff who are very valuable to us in, in terms of the support work that they do for us. Uh, on the credit side, we have uh, online degrees, uh, uh, nine bachelor's degree completion programs at the moment. Uh, and uh, is that familiar language to most of you probably? It's in alignment uh, usually with uh, uh, our community colleges. We have, uh, I think by now, about 180 two plus two agreements where uh, students can uh, complete their first two years community college and uh, can complete the last two years online through uh, Kansas State University. We have, uh, and this is uh, changing yearly, uh, we have I think at this point uh, 27 master's degrees uh, that are online, uh, approximately 22 credit bearing certificates that are online and the uh, value of that credit bearing part of the certificate is that in most cases those uh, uh, those credit hours can count toward uh, master's degrees and that sort of thing. Uh, another interesting thing goes to uh, Brandy Shop. Uh, we recently have worked with uh, the academic units to develop standalone minors. Uh, and that was a response, a direct response uh, uh, to industry stated need uh, where we had some folks in industry come to us and say well certificate that doesn't mean much to us you can go anywhere get a certificate now the certificates are all kinds of things all the way from certificate of completion to as I say uh, credit bearing uh, certificates but for some folks in industry uh, a minor in a certain area meant more to them and was more academically related uh, than simply earning a certificate. Uh, one of the things we've done has been to partner with uh, Green Science, where Brandy works, to develop, I think it's now three standalone minors uh, and working on one more. So that's, uh, that's one of the ways that we have inter interacted with uh, industry and uh, found a way to respond to it. I can tell you, as a faculty senator, I sat through a number of meetings where uh, uh, faculty senators were scratching their heads because a minor is something you do while you're working on your bachelor's. And how in the world can you separate those two? And what's more, how in the world can you allow folks from the outside to come in? Well, we did and it's working well. Uh, I want to quickly set the, uh, uh, the context in which I think many of us work. I'm not sure I will say anything that you don't already know uh, or 
that is uh, particularly unique, but uh, sometimes it helps to name the demons. <coughs> um, in terms of the environment in which we work, uh, the challenges which we face, uh, we are facing the ongoing defunding of higher education. Uh, we are facing questions about the value of higher education. Uh, there has been an attempt more and more to link degrees to uh, uh, getting jobs. Uh, uh, I want to ask back, and I fully understand that our uh, degree programs and our other uh, educational resources should uh, certainly enable folks to become more uh, uh, ready for employment, to, uh, uh, to find the jobs that they uh, seek and desire. But I also want to talk back to that, to, uh, to raise the question, or more a, a concern than a question, that uh, uh, education, especially at the higher education level, probably at the lower levels as well, uh, we need to uh, continue uh, to be vigilant in terms of educating people for life, educating people for living, because uh, uh, my concern today as we uh, focus more and more on gaining jobs or doing education for that purpose, uh, we are uh, short shrifting the, uh, the need to uh, train ourselves, to educate ourselves for living. The uh, end of that sermon. <laughs> um, we're, we're facing the challenge of uh, increasing or maybe changing expectations. Uh, let's do it cheaper, let's do it faster. Uh, we are facing questions about methodologies uh, in higher education, uh, MOOCs and badges. I heard that mentioned a while ago. Uh, and, and I share and did share with me the, uh, uh, the notes from that particular group, which I appreciated. I, I see there was uh, uh, an observation that maybe uh, uh, continuing education is fearful of MOOCs. Uh, I, that, that's not true for all of us. Uh, I think in many respects we're still watching to see uh, the, what kind of role MOOCs will play. Uh, I think in some ways it can be very functional, very valuable. Uh, I think in other ways uh, I, I simply don't see it. And the thing that is frightening is uh, uh, the support structure, the financial model that uh, to many of us is still very unclear. Uh, you put a course out there uh, uh, for everybody, you open it up, uh, one of the first uh, frightening things that's going to happen is uh, most of our uh, computing systems uh, are going to be overloaded. And uh, so those are the kinds of challenges or fears that, uh, that some of us uh, would name as we think about MOOCs. Uh, by the way, I did uh, take a MOOC uh, earlier this year. Um, how many of you have? Okay. Uh, I had a great experience. I took the, uh, the MOOC and I think it was, uh, the title was Organizing Mega Events. It was related to the Olympics. Very well done. It was out of Michigan State. Uh, I survived through the, all of the modules and I eventually passed all of the tests. Uh, and it, uh, you know, I thought that was a, an excellent contribution uh, to a, a lot of us who had that interest. But really, this was not going to be something for which we would pursue a credit or ultimately a degree. The other interesting thing is that most folks who are signing up for MOOCs are not those folks who are in formal education programs. They're the, uh, the uh, what, older generation for the most part, I suppose, are those who uh, are simply interested for the sake of learning. Uh, another challenge that we're, uh, we're facing is, uh, of course, perpetual change. Uh, everything around us is changing. Uh, I, I'm not afraid of that. I welcome it. I think that's the opportunity to uh, 
to be creative, uh, to uh, uh, design and develop uh, new opportunities for learning. I, I do think that the most challenging uh, changes that many of us encounter are what I would call internal changes. Uh, at Kansas State University, I, I think we have been fairly stable in our continuing education unit over uh, uh, several years or even decades now. But when I go to conferences, I keep hearing from my counterparts that, oh, they're going through reorganization again, or the unit, the uh, continuing education unit has been disbanded. Um, I think in many cases, our institutions don't understand this and don't know what to do with this. They sure like the money we bring in, but they don't understand uh, uh, how we do it or why we do it the way we do it. Uh, my response to that, or at least one response, is uh, uh, we have to think like businesses. Uh, most of us are uh, on self-support uh, budgets uh, or financial arrangements. Uh, we have to be business-oriented. And I would suggest further to the universities that uh, higher education, whatever else it is these days, is a business. And we uh, have to more and more run it like a business, it seems to me, if it's going to be successful. Uh, the, the only other thing that I think I would say is uh, I would suggest to you that we are the new normal. Non-traditional non is now well, I'm used to creating static most of the time anyway. Uh, we are the new normal. Uh, uh, I think the, uh, the uh, current statistic is that 86% of those who are involved in uh, uh, higher education programs today are non-traditional students. Kansas State University, 10 for the 10 percent of our student body is exclusively distance. Uh, another 13 percent is served by distance and online courses. Uh, 47 percent of our graduate students are distance students. So the day is here, and uh, I think the question for continuing education the question for the university is how do we best serve those students? How do we uh, provide them with uh, uh, an effective and valuable learning experience? Uh, and, and so I, I think uh, we, we could say that back to our universities and uh, they, they need to come to, uh, come to grips with it. Uh, uh, straight from my notes, and that's usually a, a, a better thing than uh, following the following clips. Uh, just a, a few things, and I've, uh, I've already responded to them out of uh, the continuing education report this morning. Uh, I, I, one, one thing I, I did want to respond to was uh, I've heard some talk about is it better to uh, uh, engage in educational experiences face-to-face, uh, -face, or is it uh, just as good to do online? My answer to that is yes. Uh, obviously, it, might, it depends on what, uh, what kind of educational experience uh, you're engaged in. Uh, I want my surgeon to have hands-on experience, folks. Uh, uh, and and there, there are a lot of blended uh, uh, methodologies. Uh, the thing that I have heard frequently from our uh, faculty who teach online uh, is uh, they've told me what an enrichment it has been to have those distance, non-traditional students involved in their classes because they bring more diversity, they bring a much richer background of experience, and that enriches the, uh, the class experience. So, uh, I, you know, I think both are important and invaluable and have their, have their place. And obviously it depends on how you organize uh, a course.
course, whether it is face-to-face -face or distance. So uh, I, I, think, uh, I think there is a place for both. The, uh, another thing that was mentioned was the, uh, the digital badges. Um, <clears throat> I think I've responded to that, to that for the most part. Um, there may be some value in that, but uh, I don't see that yet really uh, uh, playing into credit uh, uh, programs or degree programs. There have been a few institutions here and there that have uh, stepped up and said, we'll give you credit for that, but uh, the other interesting thing is very, very few folks are uh, seeking credit for their learning experience in the, in the MOOC environment. Uh, soft skills, <coughs> had an interesting experience the other day, and one of the ways that we're trying to build new programs is uh, to be very collaborative. Collaborative uh, on an, an interdisciplinary uh, basis, uh, engaging uh, uh, departments from across uh, the university, across colleges, but also engaging folks uh, out in industry. And we're doing that uh, as we speak uh, in the development of a certificate program in uh, uh, data analytics. Uh, to our surprise, we had two very helpful uh, focus groups with uh, uh, folks from industry the other day. To our surprise, uh, one of the things that they said to us uh, after talking about what kind of statistics and uh, computer programs and all that kind of training that, that would be necessary, uh, one of the things they said to us is, you need to include soft skills. Those who uh, understand uh, big data, those who uh, understand statistics, need to be able to communicate it to others and need to be able to engage in, uh, in dialogue with, uh, with others who might have different perspectives. So I, I think that's, that's certainly a very important, uh, important thing. Uh, <clears throat> not growing as we would like to. Uh, I can tell you that um, our distance enrollments uh, uh, tend to be flat. The interesting thing, uh, flat over the last uh, couple of years, the interesting thing is that our uh, credit hour production is going up, which means uh, there might be the same number of students, but they're taking more credit hours. Uh, I think one of the most important things there is that, uh, uh, and, and the thing that we're trying to focus on, is uh, to provide the services to these students that they're entitled to, but to do everything that we can uh, to let them uh, know that uh, we're here to provide services to them. We're glad they're uh, uh, with us, and we intend to respond to those needs uh, the best of our abilities. Uh, one other word there that we have pushed on and will continue to push on is to point out to the university that distant students are not students off to the side. Uh, distant students are university students. They pay the same fees and therefore they're entitled to the same services. And that's been a challenge. Uh, I think we're getting beyond it now, but it's been a real challenge to help the university understand that, uh, yeah, these are your students too. A student is a student is a student. Um, I, I think at that point, I'm going to stop and put the mic back in your hands. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Crowd here, so I would ask: Are there questions that you'd like any of the panelists to uh, focus back, or panelists, uh, do you have questions that you'd like to point to one another here?
and we don't pay them anything. Um, others, we try to negotiate with them so that they get a small reimbursement for what they do, but most of them don't receive what more than about $10 or so per student, and that's the way we base it is on this per student. And then if they have supplies, we can reimburse them for supplies that they might need. Um, but we try to keep our classes as low as possible. That's what our community expects. They expect uh, low-cost education from us. And sometimes it's a struggle to deliver that uh, to them. Uh, but that's the way we work it. We try to negotiate on a per, per, per student basis of reimbursement. And it depends on their level of skill, too. Some receive more than others do because perhaps they're teaching language class and they have supreme skills and people are willing to pay for that. So we try to figure out as best we can what, what the market will bear and negotiate with the student, with the instructor then. Uh, because if you charge too much, they won't have any students. And if you charge too little, then there's not enough value in what they're doing. So we try to figure that out, um, keep the pulse of the community. Okay, very good. A uh, question in the back. Yeah, Terry. Uh, we do have a small scholarship fund, yes, that allows uh, students in our programs to uh, receive up to 50% of the cost of the class. Most of our classes run in the 20 to 40 dollar range, um, so they're not outrageous in any case. Some of them, the, the the instructional classes like in lifeguard training and first aid CPR tend to run a little bit more expensive uh, because of the expenses associated with that. But most of our classes run, we have very few that are over $100 to take a class. Uh, let me, I'd like kind of, again, uh, to technical things, but one of the things that, again, the idea is trying to look forward and whether we're in the middle of the river and looking ahead, is that a rapids or is that a nice quiet pool or uh, in the train business that uh, you've got railroads and this thing called the telegraph ads and passing thing, it'll, it'll pass. Are there game changers that you see or you're worried about? What are things that keep you up at night? I thought it was interesting, Dave mentioned, uh, Reverend Stewart mentioned demons and as an ordained minister, I thought that was a, a throwback there. I have that throwback, but any, any um, scary things that you see coming down the road that would affect the kind of business that we're in. We talked a little bit about this. I heard this a little yesterday, even this morning. I think the biggest concern I have is that distance education, continuing education, does make money, and so it's easy to turn stuff out. But what makes me nervous is just turning stuff out just to be turning stuff out. And so that's probably my biggest concern. Industry comes and says, hey, I need a course in this particular area, and I need it next week. Well, I can't do that. If you want that, you're going to have to go find somewhere else to get it done. So just losing the value of the education, because really the real purpose for us is outreach, and we want to make sure we're providing an education to our stakeholders. And so that's really my concern, is watering down the education. Quality. Right. I think for me, I mentioned it already. Um, if there's not quality instruction that happens when you, whether it is online or face to face, um, having that audience come back for more is going to go by the wayside. So, making sure that we have those individuals who have the passion for what they do, but also the passion for sharing what they do with others, is absolutely critical. And then the value of that, that, that we can see the value in, in terms of repeat performances. So making sure that we are meeting that need um, from that instructional side. Because we've all been in places where we thought the topic was right on, on target, what we wanted, and we got there and the delivery was absolutely flat. So it, that, that concerns me that I'm going to make sure that we are, whatever we do, is, is top quality. And people say, wow, that was really value added to my day. Well, I, I would uh, say amen to the, uh, the quality. I think my concern is, uh, again, it goes back to the uh, do it uh, quicker and cheaper. And you can do that. Uh, some folks make a lot of money doing that. But uh, if you want quality, if you want depth, uh, uh, that requires different uh, resources, different energy to develop 
first of all, and uh, it's uh, that that cost is going to have to be covered. And uh, uh, I hope, and I uh, I see signs that uh, I I think uh, our consumers uh, do know the difference, but uh, uh, that's that is a concern. Boogeyman. Okay, now. I had Dave's comment about flatlining enrollment numbers, but income going up, which I guess would kind of be your existing students are, are liking the Kool-Aid, so that's a good deal. We Everybody's talked about student focus, and I think we've really said your student, my client, your client, your customer, your customer. Your customer. Uh, and I think one of the dilemmas is it's kind of like the, the student, the client, the customer, the community. And it's like being in the school of fish. Well, we're one of the fish, we're swimming, we kind of know what's going on, but I guess how can you keep the focus on what your customer slash student community is needing and be able to then again stay ahead of them, keep the programs in the loop that serve them? Somebody want to take a start on that? All right. I love to talk, so I'm happy to start. So I really think that evaluation component at the end of any course is really important. You can use that feedback, go back and look at your course, see where you need to improve. This is really ridiculous, but I had a course where I had a lecturer who smacked their mouth at the end of every sentence or maybe at the end of every slide. And we had several people notice and recognize that because you're listening to this lecture at your desk or wherever. And so we had to pull it. But something like that is just not only asking for the feedback, but doing something with it, I think, is really important. So, again, the swimming with the fishes and hearing what they're saying. Uh, well, we are trying to be very involved with our community so that we know what kinds of things are of interest to the community at large. Uh, we create classes based on people who call us, uh, based on what we hear from evaluations for additional classes. Um, people who call us and say, I'd like to teach this, and uh, because we don't have rules that say they can't, we'll give them a try and see if it'll fly. Uh, and then we also try to stay the, on the pulse of what's happening in the community, in the region, and across the country, and try to bring in some new ideas and find teachers who can teach something. I remember several years ago, uh, we had a Japanese student who taught this class that we didn't know anything about. It was called Shiatsu Massage. That's how long ago that was. And uh, we thought, okay, we'll give it a try. Not only did that class fill, we offered four additional sections of it that, that semester because it was such a popular idea. And then two years later, yeah, nobody cared about Shiatsu Massage. They were into something else. So kind of keeping a pulse of what's going on is what helps keep us fresh and of interest to the community. Very good. Uh, questions from the participants here. Any things you'd like to cover or observations you'd like to make related to the, again, what's, what's, <clears throat> is that light in the, in the future, the oncoming 9-11 train or 10-11 train, or is that the end of the tunnel some? Good. I, I think I, we always joked about in the conference business that the mind absorbing what the seat can endure, and these guys have been <clears throat> two and a half days. Um, Sharon, I, any other questions, uh, comments on that? I had a thought and it went away, so. Um, panelists, any other items in there that we might want to cover? Great question. So um, what we did when we first started looking at this credentialing program is we sat down with the industry and we asked them, and that's one of the outcomes was a standalone minor, and then this other track is we don't we have these industry professionals that don't have a college degree, and so what can we do for them to get them recognition and increase their employment and move them up the track? And so that's where that credentialing program came from. And so the industry recognizes it, so as these employees are going through, the industry's paying for it, so their employers are paying for it. 
right? Which is motivating the employees, hey, I'm gonna get in trouble at work if I don't get it done. And then after they complete the track, they are getting recognized and they are getting better jobs. And so it's really, we took the path that we weren't gonna go down this road unless the industry accepted what we were doing. And that's why I think we've had so much success. So. Other comments? Agent? I have a question. Higher education, you're caught up in basically teaching people to find a job rather than what might be called the classical liberal arts. But the money, particularly on the continuing ed side, seems to be the revenue generating comes from getting people in because you're able to tell them we're going to teach you this and you're going to be able to get a job. How do you balance that tension as budgets are being cut at every state, particularly in this state, for higher <coughs> How do you balance that out? Because I'm with you, and I think we should be teaching. I, I think if you go to college, you should be educated. That's not learning to do a job. Well, uh, I, I think balance is, is the strategy and the appropriate response. Uh, um, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, one to say, well, just don't worry about the job where you want to go in life in terms of uh, your vocation. But uh, what, what I would lobby for is that, uh, you know, that's one dimension of who we are. But uh, the, uh, another dimension is that we are uh, to be responsible citizens, to be mature and thinking adults. Uh, how do we learn to do that? Where do we learn to do that? And I. My experience is that one of the prime places was uh, uh, through my baccalaureate uh, uh, studies. Uh, the way we market that uh, uh, is, yes, there is the focus on uh, enhancing your career. Uh, and that's an appropriate goal. It's an appropriate educational goal. But uh, in, in uh, many of the uh, publications that we put out, you, you'll recognize that emphasis. Uh, but that's uh, that's one among several emphases that I think are very important uh, in terms of uh, what generates uh, revenue. Uh, again, I think we're dealing, for the most part, with uh, folks who want a solid uh, educational experience, and um, uh, I don't think we've fallen into that trap. Do it fast, do it cheap, and get me a job. I don't know if that answers your question. Again, it's good. As a technical college, you know, that is what we are about. You know, that is our mission is to have people come in and get jobs. But we also believe we have to balance that on, on the education side. And we know how important it is on the critical thinking side. Um, within the industries that we are preparing students for, it is critical thinking all the way through. You can't do anything without that critical thinking side. But also all those other skills that are so important to being a good employee in, in general. And that means being able to write and do those mathematical equations and to get along with people well. Um, so we encourage our students if, they've come, if they're coming only for a certificate, that they do have the option now to continue to get that associate's degree, and they have that opportunity to continue on with that education. So having a pathway now for our students um, is absolutely critical. And this has only been really with us for the last uh, 12 years or so. Uh, prior to being an independent college, we were associated with the school district. And so our students, we're done. I think that's it. <laughs> Check one. <laughs> Our students came to us then um, and got a diploma, and we had full programs to get that diploma. They got jobs, but then when they wanted to continue that education because they recognized that they needed more, they really were facing closed doors. They had to start over, essentially. So the fact that we now have pathways for students that lead from a certificate to an associate's degree to a baccalaureate degree through what Dave was talking about on the two plus twos with, with our colleges, 
um, to a baccalaureate of a science degree in technology management. That's been a huge, a huge opportunity. Um, and then we do have students who continue on to get that master's degree and that PhD. So it really is a, a continuum of learning and we really are embracing that uh, as a technical college and recognizing how important that whole, that whole aspect is. But then working with our industry when they say we need our employees to get up to speed on a particular piece to improve in that job performance, we do that as well. So we're very responsive to the industry then too to make sure that we are providing what they need uh, on that continuing education uh, realm. Very good. Thank you. Other questions? Um, we've got 10, 15 minutes and certainly we can break early <clears throat> again if you've had your fill, but again, I'm going back to the Reverend here, but one of the issues classically among folks who have been in adult education programs and again having an undergrad in, in ag, but then getting a master's and an ABD and continuing higher ed, <clears throat> one of the philosophical underpinnings of adult education or lifelong learning was the extent to which a continuing educator, an adult educator's responsibility to society. And that is kind of like, does the pastor need to reach out to the flock and say, be kinder to one another, treat your children well, treat the person you live with fairly and decently and honestly in your actions with other human beings, and you start taking that back in terms of the role of the institution pushing the ball forward, then I've been saying, where did they go, I must follow them. Then trying to follow Twitter to see, you know, which starlet on Star Search is trending on Twitter, and you put up a quick class on, what's Lindsay Lohan doing today, or what's uh, Miley Cyrus uh, latest up to, which would sell. Uh, so again, uh, obviously, maybe Brandy, you've got it technical, but for the other three, this idea of and in the industry, do you need to get a green program going in Kansas when we've got the Pope brothers pumping oil out of the Southwest? Uh, you know, or wind energy when we've got, what is it, our legislature just tried to Kill. rescind a renewal energy bill that was passed several years ago. And now they're trying to roll that back. So anyway, I'll shut up. Comments on that? Well, I think you've uh, stopped preaching and gone to meddling now. <laughs> But I think that is, uh, I, yes, I, uh, I appreciate what you say, Chuck, about the, uh, the personal inter interactions, the personal ethics. But folks, uh, uh, we hear every day that we have to push those uh, uh, ethical uh, choices, those ethical values on out to the uh, society and even to the global community. What we are doing in our, uh, not just our communities, but in our nation and uh, around the globe, does have uh, literally survival implications for every one of us now. There are ethical, critically, critical ethical issues that uh, beg to be addressed today. And uh, that's, that's where my concern is. Uh, <laughs> Yes, personal relationships, uh, uh, appropriate interactions, et cetera, et cetera. Very good, but that's not enough given what we're facing today, and I do think it's reached the crisis point. Linda, you want to take a crack? No, come on. <laughs> Don't leave me out here. Other, <laughs> um, other uh, comments, discussion? Again, uh, we, 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 we've worked hard. I, let, let's, let's give the panel a hand for showing up. <laughs> Again, and the idea of uh, balancing the fear of landmines and the thrill or exultation of finding that diamond in the rough or that nugget of gold if you just dig through the pile, and of course we all have the stories of the boy and the pony and everything else, but again, that's, that's what we do. 
uh, we're out there digging Chris's winners and losers or successes and not so much. Um, you just got to keep swinging. Uh, it's baseball season. Nobody hits a home run, nobody gets a base hit, and let's say stand to the plate, how's that? Stand to the plate, be willing to get beamed on the head with the ball, get called out because you were sure that ball was outside the strike zone and you've got somebody else disagreed with you. So that, that's what we do. It is a worthwhile effort. Aceware is here to help you in that process. And again, by working together, and we've done the recognition last night, night before last for people who have stayed with us and we thank you, we honor you, uh, and we hope to keep that continue for another 10 and 20 and 25 years. So uh, folks, it's been a great conference panel. It's been a great capstone. Uh, thank you much. Everybody drive safe and uh, we'll look forward to a great 2014. Thank you.